Hello, and welcome to HarperCollins Children's Books Fall 2023 Librarian Preview. I'm Maggie Reagan, Senior Editor of Books for Youth at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to today's slide presentation and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. If you have any trouble, please contact us at webinars at booklistonline.com. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the captions icon on the toolbar mentioned earlier. From there, you can select show or hide captions from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. And finally, Booklist expects all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates this standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may, at the discretion of the organizers, be immediately removed. We have a wonderful program for you today. So without further ado, I'll pass things off to the Harper Stacks team. Take it away. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Um, I am Patty Rosati, and I um, work in the School and Library Marketing Department at HarperCollins. And we're really excited to have you here today. We've got four terrific authors with us. Um, and we've got lots more books coming this fall that we want to tell you about. So um, a tiny bit more um, uh, housekeeping to go through, and that is we sent a spreadsheet of the titles that we're presenting today out before the webinar, so you can take your notes on that. Um, we also, um, all the titles we talk about today and more, many, many more, because of course we can't tell you about all the books that we're publishing this fall in this one hour. But if you go to NetGalley or to Edelweiss, you can download PDFs of Galley, excuse me, PDFs of the picture books, um, and you can download eGalleys. Um, and then speaking of Anal Vice, as I just mentioned, um, many more of the titles that we're publishing in the fall are there. We have the full catalog, all that's coming from us in the fall. So definitely check that out. All right, let's get to it because we've got four amazing authors ready to talk to you. And the first one is Joanna Ho. So Joanna Ho um, is the best-selling author of many books and she's only been at it for two years, which is in extraordinary. Um, some of the books that you know well are Eyes That Kiss in the Corners, Eyes That Speak to the Stars, Playing at the Border, One Day. And then for her first novel that she wrote last year, The Silence That Binds Us, that got an Apollo uh, Youth Honor um, Award last year. So she'll be with us at ALA um, celebrating that wonderful honor. Joanna has a really terrific background. Not only is she an amazing author, but she was an English teacher, a dean, a vice principal, and a professional development mastermind. In her fall picture book, Say My Name, her perfect text illuminates the key message of the story, and it's a really important one, learning about the history behind others' identities and the importance of saying people's names correctly, despite how complex they may be. Joanna's passion for equity in books and education is matched only by her love of homemade chocolate chip cookies, outdoor adventures, and dance parties with her kids. Please help me welcome Joanna Ho. Hi everyone, it's such an honor to be here with all of you. Shout out to all the librarians. I'm sitting in a public library right now and they set up this beautiful space for me to present. Um, I'm gonna jump right in and I'm super excited to share with you about Say My Name. Um, can you just show that? Can you all see my slides? Hopefully you can. Um, so basically I'm gonna start by just sharing from the beginning where this book is from. And this is a picture of me 
uh, with my mom. My mom is from Taiwan. Her name is Chen Wanling. And I grew up listening to her and hearing her introduce herself as my name is Wan Ling Chen, W A N L I N G, always like this. And the response was often something like Wing Lang, Wang Long, or something like Wendy. Um, and at the time, I didn't know. I didn't like, you didn't really process that, you know, in the flattening of the tones of her name, in the constant needing to spell, and then the constant butchering of her name so many parts of her and the beauty and musicality and so much of who she was and what she brought here was lost. Just as a really random side note, that is a picture of me in first grade. And I wanted to be a teacher because at that time anyways, because um, my teacher has got a lot of presents at winter break. And so I thought that that would be a pretty sweet job. Um, this and, and so for me, my own journey with my name really was a lot about my last name. This is a picture of me in high school with my younger brother. And you can imagine with a last name like Ho, with so many alternate meetings here in the States, um, there was a lot of, you know, jokes. Sometimes I thought they were funny. Sometimes I really didn't like them. I didn't always know how to respond when I didn't like them. So often I just laughed. And then as a teacher, I did become a teacher, though, not because of the presence. Um, that is actually where my journey to really loving and owning and just appreciating my name became. So you can also imagine as a teacher in high school, when I introduce myself, particularly to ninth graders, when I say, hi, I'm your, I'm your English teacher. My name is Miss Ho. The reaction often was uh, one of snickering or laughing from you know some students and particularly in middle school. But in a profession where if if you haven't earned the respect and you haven't earned the trust and built relationships with students where a name like mine could really be used as, um, you know, we all know students talk about their teachers behind their backs for good or for not so good. And I just knew that my name was something that could be used to sort of make fun of me or to create a lot of jokes about me. But instead, it became this thing where students would yell it in the hall, Miss Ho, you know, what's up? And I just would, and I, you know, as the longer I was in education, the more I sort of, I loved to hear them say my name. And I knew that they said it with such love and such care and such respect. And um, I knew on some level that I had worked to earn that, but it really sort of made me think not only about my own journey with my name, but as an educator, I saw so much of how much just names mean to people. And both, again, for growth and for validation, but also for harm. So I'm going to switch my screen. This is a video um, taken from a professional development session that I created uh, with the new teacher center. And so in this video, you'll see a young student who um, shares a little about it, his journey in schools with his name. Like a lot of things changed. Um, you know, we were allowed to talk Spanish because if we talked too much Spanish, we'd be put into the Spanish group and you didn't want to be in the Spanish group. Um, the teacher in there, she changed my name. Well, my name is Marcos. And um, she started, you know, it was an English group, so she changed my name to Mark. And, um, you know, it might, might not seem like anything, but you know, I was still, I was, you know, just, you know, growing up and stuff. And um, just what I got out of the, out of being put in the English group was that, you know, um, English was better. And, you know, if, it was just, it was, it was hard, like, growing up, because at home, you know, my family spoke English, but it was, you know, primarily Spanish. And it was hard from school, you know, being called Mark and not being allowed to talk Spanish um, to going home and being called Marcos. And, you know, this leads to my entire experience was um, in fifth grade, I had, I had this male Mexican-American teacher. Mostly it, they had been um, um, females and they had been white. But, um, you know, that... There's nothing wrong with that. It was just like I didn't have anyone really to relate to or look up to. And just in fifth grade, yeah, you know, and when I met this teacher, 
it just it just totally changed everything because you know he he understood he had grown up here you know he had been through a similar experience and um you know, he understood and, and he he asked me you know like the first day of the class that you know they ask you this is your name but you know would you like us to call you by something else and you know like my name was down there as mark and not marcos anymore you know even on papers and report cards it was mark um and at first, I didn't see anything wrong with it. You know, I, I was Mark. And then just starting to talk, I started talking to him and he just started, you know, he got me in touch with like, he, he was really into his culture. And, and it was just easier for me to like relate to him because, you know, the more I talked to him, the more I saw that, you know, I, you know, I wanted to be someone who I wasn't. And he never pressured me into, you know, being more Mexican or nothing. He just let me be who I was. You know, through him, I saw that. I didn't have to be more, you know, to be successful. Should we share my screen? Back to this one. And so when we talk about the work of equity and inclusion and representation, sometimes that work starts with something that is as simple, but as profound and as meaningful as a name and as saying that name correctly. Because for all of us, <clears throat> and something that it took me so long to learn is that my name, my English name, my last name, my Chinese name, um, they encompass so much more of who we are and the cultures and the people and the history and the stories and the families that we carry. And so often um, in schools in particular, but a lot of places when people don't take the care to say our names correctly, there is an erasure that happens and an internal struggle of identity, of what it means to be successful, of what it means to be human and valued and worthy. And if we could all start so simply as learning to take the care to say someone's name correctly, that is a huge and really, I think, powerful step in supporting a society that is truly more opening and more open and accepting and I think equitable for, for all students. So with that in mind, what I thought I would do is introduce you to the six characters in this book um, with a video. I, to the six characters, they are Chinese, Iranian, Ghanaian, Navajo, um, Mexican, and oh, what am I forgetting? I think that's it. And Chinese, oh yeah, me. <laughs> and um, and these are the reason I chose these particular groups are because these are communities where I personally have felt really at home over many different experiences in my life. I lived abroad in Ghana for a year. I teach in predominantly Latinx and um, Polynesian communities. I'm Chinese and uh, some and also an overlapping all of these are um, deep friendships that I have developed with people and who have helped me so much in creating this book. And so I invited some of those folks to share and to read the names so that as you share, thank you, and hopefully you do, but thank you um, as you share that you will also know and can hear the beauty and the correct pronunciation of these names. Here we go. My name is He Xiaoguang. My name is Ofakibaha Tupomalo. My name is Bijan Hosseini. My name is Najona Yazi. My name is Sochi Luna. My name is Akusia Echampong. Say my name. 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 Here it just says, anything less is not me. And so that is what I would leave you with is just, that is my hope in this story is conveying that our names are everything and anything less than the, what we've been given, unless we've specifically asked and the nicknames are okay. Um, those represent so much more. And that's really what I hope to share and to capture in this book. Thank you so much. Oh, Joanna, that is so beautiful. I have chills, I'm tearing up. Um, I think it's so important to honor everyone's, but especially children's identity. Um, and this is such a beautiful book for that. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Mimi Rankin. I'm Associate Director of School and Library Marketing here at Harper Children's. I can't wait to tell you about some of the fantastic picture books uh, on this list for the fall, including our new initiative, Shake Up Your Story Time. Uh, next slide, please. 
So with Shake Up Your Storytime, we hope to provide uh, resources for teachers and librarians who work with our youngest of readers to help build inclusive and diverse bookshelves, starting from the most accessible shelves for little hands. We will have an educator's guide coming later this year, but for now, uh, keep an eye on hc.com slash shakeupyourshelves for more information. Next slide, please. So first book I want to talk about in Shake Up Your Storytime uh, is I'm From. Um, this is a poetic, heartwarming ode to the defining small moments of a boy's life by a brilliant debut author, uh, Gary, Gay, Gary Gray Jr. Um, and a Caldecott honoree, Oge Mora. Um, and this is perfect for fans of Last Stop on Market Street. Next slide, please. And then we have another Vamos book, which we are so excited about, uh, from New York Times bestselling author, Pura Bel Pre, award-winning author, illustrator Raul III. Vamos, Let's Go Read follows Little Lobo and his friends as they explore uh, their library's Libro Love Book Festival. And uh, I'm hoping all librarians will appreciate this one as much as we do. Next slide, please. Tokyo Night Parade. This book is so, so stunning. And I love this description. Spirited Away meets Where the Wild Things Are by way of yokai mythology in this enchanting picture book debut, um, following a Black Japanese girl as she celebrates what might be her last night parade of 100 demons in Tokyo before returning back to New York. This is a beautiful um, book on uh, representation and just look at those spreads. It's absolutely stunning. Next slide, please. All right, a letter for Bob. You can see that wonderful quote from uh, Dr. Debbie Reese. Um, this is part of our Heart Drum imprint, um, which if you're not familiar with it, is a fully in, uh, Native and Indigenous Voices imprint here at HarperCollins Children's Books. Um, author Kim Rogers, who is Wichita, and illustrator Jonathan Nelson, who is Dene, bring to life a letter written by a Wichita girl who says goodbye to her beloved family car named Bob, uh, thanking him for all of the memories of powwows, vacations, and time spent with family. Family. Next slide, please. All right, Rock Your Mox. This is another heart drum book. Um, this happy, vibrant tribute to Rock Your Mox Day, which is November 15th. Um, and it's just celebrating the joy and power of wearing moccasins and the native pride that comes with them. And this is perfect for all year long, but especially Native American Heritage Month. Next slide, please. I also think this one is just stunning when the fog rolls in, uh, when a thick fog rolls in and irresistible little puffin is lost in unfamiliar territory. This is an exceptional picture book for social emotional learning uh, about navigating uncertainty, opening your mind and finding your way back to your flock. Next slide, please. Oh, Olive. I, really, we do have a stellar picture book. Let's just look at this, these art spreads. Um, this is Leanne Cho's hilarious and vibrant debut picture book as both all author and illustrator, and she celebrates the creativity of a young girl breaking from the tradition of her famous artist parents and going against the status quo to express her own unique style. Next slide, please. All right, Kicks in the Sky. So if you read and loved Boogie Boogie, y'all, as much as we did, this is the next book we have from C.G. Esperanza, who is a Pura Bel Pre and Coretta Scott King Honor um, recipient. Um, C.G. Esperanza presents a stunning rhythmic picture book about kids discovering that the shoes hanging from telephone wires can give them magical abilities. Next slide, please. Let me flip over my notes. I mean, just look at the title, look at the cover and the spreads. This is the playfully interactive tale about a very cranky book that might not be so cranky after all. And it's the first picture book uh, collaboration of Tony and Angela Di Terlizzi, a best-selling husband and wife team. It is laugh out loud funny. Uh, I think everybody needs to add this to their uh, to buy list. Next slide, please. Pozo the Sparrow. So this is Caldecott medalist Alan Say's uh, tale of a young boy who saves a baby bird from the local bullies and transports uh, readers to a stirring memory of his childhood in Japan. This is based on a true story and gorgeously illustrated. Uh, this is from an iconic picture book creator and is not to be missed. Next slide, please. <laughs> I'm stuck. Uh, this is a tender and very funny book, uh, look at the way tough emotions can make us feel stuck and how the presence of a good friend and a deep belly laugh can make it easier to get through stormy feelings. Um, this is complete with back matter to help stuck readers feel better through noticing, smelling, talking, and taking a deep breath. And this is a perfect pick for those who loved Grumpy Monkey and The Rabbit Listened. Next slide, please. 
what Rosa brought. Author uh, Jacob Sager Weinstein and illustrator Eliza Wheeler uh, deliver a powerful and poignant picture book about a young Jewish girl fleeing Nazi occupation with her parents. This is actually drawing on the childhood experiences of the author's mother. The story of family, immigration, and identity shows that love can cross oceans and last, last lifespans. Next slide, please. All right, and I just want to finish up with some new titles from a, some of your favorite authors. Um, we have The Christmassy Cactus, um, which this is the cutest Christmas book ever, and it is already going to inspire my Christmas decor in my apartment this year. Um, it's an irresistible Christmas story about friendship, self-acceptance, and the power of um, excuse me, and the power of believing from New York Times bestselling author, Beth Ferry. And then we have the picture book debut from Julie Murphy. So hopefully you already love her middle grade books, her teen books, her adult books. And now this is her picture book debut. Um, it is told with Julie's trademark humor and heart. This is a clevy, clever, funny, body po positive story about loving yourself. And then we have the next book in the food group books. This is number seven, can you believe, from Jory John and Pete Oswald, um, which is the big cheese, who is a wheel of cheddar, who learns that maybe winning isn't everything in life. Um, and that is it from me. Again, you can get all of these full PDF spreads on Edelweiss under links. So go ahead and check those out. Thanks so much. Great, thanks Mimi. Okay, all right. So up next, we have award-winning creators and childhood best friends, Mac Barnett and Sean Harris. Uh, they're back this fall with the second installment of their Blue Bonnet finalist and indie bestseller se uh, series, the First Cat in Space, entitled The First Cat in Space and The Soup of Doom. What started as a live cartoon on Instagram during COVID quarantine has turned into a laugh out loud collaborative graphic novel series that is the perfect book to hand to all of Mac and Sean's fans, as well as those insatiable readers of those Dogman books. Mac and Sean are powerhouse creators and children's books heroes to many kids, teachers, and librarians, and to me. We're so happy to have them here together with us this morning from the West Coast. So thanks both for getting up early and starting your day with us. Please help me welcome Mac Barnett and Sean Harris. Hey. Oh my hey. goodness. Hi, everybody. Hey. I'm Mac. I'm Sean. Uh, this is this is Rafe, who is a little surprised to be here, as we as we all are a little surprised to be here. So wonderful to be with you. Uh, thank you for indulging us, the three of us. We had a little bit of a childcare situation this morning, <laughs> and so we have a special guest. Uh, so, uh, as you heard, Sean and I are collaborators. We made this book right here. The first cat in space ate pizza. Pizza, pizza, pizza. But we are not just collaborators. Sean's my best friend. We've been friends since we were seven years old. And a lot of people don't believe me when I say that. We got the proof. This is us on the Castro Valley Thunderbolts. I don't know. I don't, do we have any Thunderbolts fans out there? Any any uh, big Thunderbolts, Castro Valley Thunderbolts fans? Smash the like button. There's no like button on a Zoom seminar. Uh, and Sean and I, we hang out all the time. Uh, we normally get together at least once a week. But uh, in March of 2020, uh, when shelter in place orders went in place, uh, we decided, hey, like, instead of getting together, maybe we could still see each other a bunch if we if we made a project together. So we decided to make a live cartoon. Uh, and if you've never heard of live cartoons before, that's because we invented them. See, what we would do is every Saturday morning, we would wake up really early and uh, in, we'd get on Zoom, but instead of, you know, going to Zoom to have an amazing librarian preview, uh, we would come on Zoom and we would make a live cartoon. Sean would turn his camera around. He would film his drawings. We would do voices, sing songs, play sound effects. And we made a 12 part science fiction epic called <clears throat> The First Cat in Space Ate Pizza. Pizza, pizza, pizza. Uh, the joke really was like, we made just the first one on a Saturday uh, and, and said like, hey, 
what if we made just like one episode and and it was called the first cat in space ate pizza it's and it was sort of like a, a 50s b movie meets 90s jerry bruckheimer movie and ended with a ridiculous cliffhanger and the cat never ate pizza uh and then we just ended and that was it and so we did that we put it up online thousands of people watched and they were like we can't wait for episode two we had no intention of making a second episode it was, the first episode was the hardest thing we had ever done uh but we decided to it turned out to be the most joyful beautiful storytelling experience i've ever had yeah um and those stories became the rough draft for this book which has now grown this joyful community experience and now we're ready to show that cover yes, we've got sir. book two here we go we're still workshopping whether we're going to do an echo or do you know how we got, got, it. I got, it. I got okay it. here we go the first cat in space and the soup of doom. Doom, doom, doom. That's good. That was a that was a that was a surprise to me. Soup, 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 a doom, 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 soup. Super, super all right all right all right all right all right we don't have much time Still we don't have much time we're workshopping <laughs> that was not so uh we wanted to introduce you a little bit to the world of our books it's very hard to read a graphic novel out loud you know because there are like lots of little panels and 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 dialogue but we figured out a way to do it and i'm going to share my screen right now this is always not the easiest thing to do to share a screen but but let's Let's see. Let's hope this works. Here we go. Quick time player, and we'll press play now. First cat in space. Eight. Pizza. 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 Chapter two. Project forty-seven. Beneath an active volcano, in a secret lab ten miles underground. Earth's smartest scientists toil in an experiment known only as Project 47. Behind this blast-proof steel door lies the moon's Satan and Earth's last hope. A cat. Meow. But not just any cat, with a brain enhanced by microchips and a suit Upgraded with cybernetic biotechnology, this fantastic feline is a hero the likes of which the universe has never seen. Cadet, we need you to blast off for the moon and take care of those rats. You accept this mission. Meow. Good. Ready for launch, cadet? Ten, nine, eight, seven seconds later. Doctor, do you think this will work? Mathematically speaking, the chances of this mission succeeding are... Oh, my wrinkly pinky toe. My thoughts exactly, sir. Tune in for the next installment of The First Cat in... Space eight pizza. Pizza, 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 pizza. Oh, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? That that was an intense cliffhanger. Yeah. So, uh, we wanted to let you know too. Uh, part of what we we're really proud of of this book is just the way in which 
we wanted to create this big joyful world inside the book, but also outside of it as well. So uh, those live cartoons we told you about that we made three years ago, we archived those all at the firstcatinspace.com. You can watch those. They really serve as the rough draft of the first book. And, uh, you know, most of the time, authors, of course, don't let you see our rough drafts. We want to show only the final version. But we've loved as we've started to travel around to schools and talk to kids about this book. Uh, kids who've watched these live cartoons, we talk to them about revision in this very concrete, very fun way. Um, compare the rough draft to the book. Uh, talk about the changes we made, why we made them. Uh, I think that that revision is usually neither concrete nor fun. Uh, so it's it's been nice to have that way of talking to them about that process. Uh, we also have songs all over our books. I love it when there are songs in books, uh, but I also get a little nervous because I never know, like, you know, how am I, what's the tune? How am I supposed to sing this? Uh, but in book one and book two, the first cat in space ate pizza. Pizza, pizza. And the first cat in space and the soup of doom. Doom, doom, doom. Not only do we have songs, but if you go to the firstcatinspace.com, Sean and I are singing those songs so you know what they sound like. Um, really, I think uh, we always love to create big worlds inside and outside of our books, but, but the genre of science fiction especially lends itself, I think, to that kind of big world building and big community building, too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just been... It's been the most, continues to be the most fun thing to have this ever expanding, uh, uh, just community of readers around the story. We have so much fun telling it. We can't wait for you to see our new book. Thank you so much for sharing it with your students. Um, and I hope you enjoy. The first cat in space and the soup of Doom. Soup, 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 oh doom, soup, 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 oh doom, soup, 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 oh doom. Take it, Frankie. Hey, doom, soup, 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 oh doom, soup. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much for that, Mac and Sean. Um, as well as our special surprise guest. I know many readers, my nephew included, are reading this next First Cat in Space book with bated breath. Um, my name is Christina Carpino. I'm marketing coordinator, and I'm going to tell you about some absolutely fabulous middle grade titles coming up this fall. You can go on to the next slide. First up, we have A Horse Named Sky from the perennial library favorite, Roseanne Perry. In this new standalone companion novel, to her other titles, including A Wolf Called Wander, readers will meet a young cult named Skye. He loves to run and explore the open land, but humans have begun encroaching and soon there are few resources for the horses to share. Things get even harder when Skye is captured and forced to be part of the Pony Express. Will Skye be able to escape and find his family? Next slide, please. Treasure Island, and uh, Run Away Gold is a reimagining of the classic adventure novel, this time set in modern day Manhattan and written by the award winning, very popular, and amazing author Jewel Parker Rhodes, the talent behind Ghost Boys, Towers Falling, Ninth Ward, and many other titles that you're probably familiar with. Jewel Parker Rhodes is known for making history accessible and for making Black history come alive for young readers in an engaging way. She continues that here. With the three kids at the heart of the story, skateboarding through New York City, solving riddles that take them through the nearly forgotten history of Black New York, all wrapped up in a pirate adventure story. It's smart, thought-provoking, and fun. Next slide, please. If you could choose to be a god forever, would you do it? That's the question posed in critically acclaimed author Corianne Haydu's spellbinding The Widely Unknown Myth of Apple and Dorothy. Dorothy is a descendant of Pandora. Yep, that Pandora. She's not exactly high on the godly chain, and when she loses her mother, her grief threatens to consume her. Apple, however, is the descendant of Zeus and Hera and is practically perfect in every way. The two are very different, but they've become unlikely friends. Read this book to find out if their friendship can survive the solstice and the decisions that come with it. 
Next slide. Improbable Tales of Baskerville Hall is the first book in a new series by Ali Standish that's perfect for fans of the Mysterious Benedict Society or Enola Holmes. Young Arthur Conan Doyle is attending a secret school for extraordinarily gifted children, Baskerville Hall. There, Arthur, his friends, and even his enemies are invited into a secret society known as the Clover. Full of puzzles and mysteries, this is a highly engaging book for any reader. Next slide. Here we have some fabulous fantasy middle grade for you. Uh, another new series coming our way from debut author, E.C. Hendricks, is Adia Kelbara and the Circle of Shamans. Adia Kelbara is a 12-year-old orphan whose extended family believes she's possessed by a demon. Hard to deny that when she suddenly develops some unexplained powers. And soon she's given the chance to be away from her family, so she takes it and ends up at the Academy of Shamans. Unfortunately, there she discovers that the kingdom's emperor actually is possessed by a demon. Um, so can Adia use her newfound power to save the day? We have Coyote Queen by Jessica Vitalis. Uh, stuck in a trailer with her mom and her mom's alcoholic boyfriend, Larry, is not exactly where 12-year-old Bud wants to be. Instead, she wishes to be free like the coyotes she sees wandering outside. Bud decides to sign up for a local beauty pageant in an attempt to win some money and use it to escape. The more she thinks about escape, the more her connection with the coyotes grows. If you like your middle grade books with a lot of heart and just a touch of magic, this is your perfect next book. And Shannon Smith makes the shift to middle grade with Rayleigh Mann and the Company of Monsters. Rayleigh has a reputation as a troublemaker, so it's only natural that he's going to sneak out on All Hallows' Eve to go trick-or-treating and maybe cause a little bit of mayhem. But in the process, he gets way more than he bargained for, full of jumbies, the boogeyman, and all kinds of other Caribbean lore-inspired monsters. This fantasy is sure to delight and frighten in all the best ways. Next slide, please. If you're anything like me, you were blown away by Courtney Comrie's debut no novel and verse, Rain Rising. I'm thrilled to announce that we have another book about Rain. In this story, Rain's in a new school year away from the support system that she built in eighth grade. Combined with her brother being away at college, Rain isn't feeling this change. When an older boy starts paying extra attention to her, she struggles to open up about what's happening to her mom and her new counselor. Full of hope and honesty, this is a beautiful book with lots of social emotional learning ties. Next slide. And here we have two fabulous debut authors that we want to talk to you about. Uh, first up, we have Just Lizzie. A lot of changes go on when you're 14, and for Lizzie, those changes include moving and dealing with friends who'd rather date than play dolls. She feels left behind and struggles to explain that she doesn't have any interest in boys or girls. But when they learn about asexual reproduction and plants during science class, Lizzie starts to wonder if people can be asexual too. This is a really nuanced book about sexual identity, growing up, and learning that there are many ways to live and love. And we have Tethered to Other Stars by Elisa Stone Leahy. Wendy Toledo knows that black holes and immigration police have one thing in common. They can make things disappear without a trace. Wendy hopes her family can keep their heads down and focuses her energy on winning the school science fair. But Wendy ends up caught in the middle of school bullying, her family secrets, and ICE detaining someone she cares about. Dealing with timely topics, this novel expertly weaves STEM themes and immigration activism into a must-read novel for fans of Efren Divided. Next slide, please. And to round out the middle grade portion of today's presentation, we've got Ink Girls, which is a fantasy graphic novel about fighting censorship. Cynthia is a printer's apprentice. That is, until she and her maestra are arrested for printing the news that the Principesa's brother has been stealing from the city. Readers will connect to this book's characters instantly and be drawn into the breathtaking illustrations and fight for the freedom to tell the truth. Thanks, Christina. And again, um, more, many more middle grade uh, books um, are coming to you this fall. So check out our Edelweiss uh, collection and you will see, and you will see them. <clears throat> okay, we have one more author speaker and I am uh, super excited about her. And uh, she is Alana K. Arnold, a National Book Award finalist, 
Prince Award honoree, whose catalog of books for kids and teens, it includes picture books, chapter books, middle grade novels, and YA fiction, she can do it all, has garnered dozens of starred reviews, state list citations, and other accolades. Uh, many of us do sit up and take notice when she has a new book. Uh, the novel she's written that we're publishing this fall is, I think, one of the best books that she's ever created, and that is saying something. The Blood Years is the harrowing story of a young woman's coming of age during the Holocaust in Romania. It's a story based on Alana's grandmother's own experience of growing up in and escaping from Romania, a corner of the world that's often overlooked in World War II books. This is unlike any Holocaust narrative that I've read, and I am beyond delighted that she's here with us today to tell us about The Blood Years. Please help me welcome Alana K. Arnold. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm I'm so glad and grateful to be here and to have this opportunity to share for the very first time um, the little bit about my book that's coming out on October 10th. And so I'm going to share my screen and tell you about the blood years. Let's see here. Ready to start? Okay. Um, so the blood years is my debut historical fiction young adult novel. And it's more than that. It's also what I've made of uh, the stories my grandmother shared with me about being a Jewish teenager in Chernovitz, Romania during World War II and the Holocaust. Um, though my Nana told me many things and I knew there was a story to write, in order to craft a novel, I had to do deep research into the complex and unique history of her particular region, uh, other survivors' narratives, creative work produced by those survivors, scholarly works about the events that transpired in and around Chernovitz, Romania, and much, much more. Imagine that someone gives you a precious plate and it shatters. Now imagine dropping that plate into the shards of six million other plates, uh, some radically different from your plate, some nearly identical. Can you ever put the plate together again? Most likely, no. But what you can do is sift gently and delicately and reverently through the shards, finding as many of the pieces of your plate as you can and collecting other sharp edged, beautiful, terrible pieces as well. And then you can take all those pieces and sit with them for many years and then do your very best to make something with them, a mosaic, a piece of art that honors the original plate, even if it cannot be salvaged, that finds a way to make art from so many broken, priceless things. That is what writing this book felt like. It's my Nena's story, but it's not hers alone. It's also a tribute to the other Chernovitzers who endured the Holocaust and the pogroms before, and to all those who perished. I always knew that both my grandparents had survived the Holocaust, uh, my grandfather in Poland, and my grandmother in Romania. Here I am celebrating my college graduation with them. They met and married after the war. I learned about concentration camps in school. And when I asked my Nana if she'd been imprisoned, she said, not exactly. What I didn't understand for many years was that the experience of Jews and Roma and disabled and gay people in Romania was different from the stories made popular in American literature, media, and history books. There were no concentration camps in Romania, but that absolutely didn't mean there was no Holocaust. Instead, there was a systemic, slow erasure of Jewish rights and protections that began before the war and amplified throughout, resulting in the Jewish residents losing their status as citizens, their right to do business, the corralling of the Jewish population into an inhumanely small and unsanitary ghetto, and waves of brutal deportations and murders. In the blood years, I chose to call the city what my grandmother called it, Chernovitz, though it's gone by different names depending on who was in charge. As my character Rika says, we call the city by her maiden name, Chernovitz, rather than Cernuti, the name Romanians thrust upon her when they took her from Austria after the Great War. The war years in Chernovitz, Romania, and the fate of its Jewish population have not been extensively written about. It should be common knowledge that Romania is the country that kills the most Jews of any other country except Nazi Germany. 
Even before the war, there was a long history of Romanian anti-Semitism and violent attacks on Jews. During World War II, over 400,000 Jews were murdered in Romanian controlled areas. Unlike Germany, Romania has not done the work of acknowledging and remembering its terrible history. In fact, during communism, the Romanian government blocked access to and even destroyed archival material and deflected all blame into Nazi Germany. It was only after the fall of communism that archives were slowly opened and remaining artifacts started to be accessed. This process is still ongoing and most people are still unfamiliar with the history of this region and the extent of the murders. Here's a map of the region before the wars when Chernovitz was still part of Romania. I've circled uh, Bukovina, the uh, region that uh, my grandmother's city is from. You can see it's right there, kind of on the border between Romania, um, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Ukraine. It looks different now. Uh, here's a more current map. You can see that Chernovitz is now part of Ukraine. Um, I wanted to visit the area, but couldn't because, as you know, um, there's an invasion of Ukraine happening by Russia, which is another sort of terrible repetition of the past as part of the book is about uh, the Russians coming to my grandmother's city. So uh, you don't need to read all this, but uh, I'll just tell you a little briefly. This is about what happened in the region. So after World War I and the collapse of Austria-Hungary, the area around Chernovitz called Northern Bukovina was awarded to Romania. So my grandparents' family considered themselves Austrians, but they became Romanians before my grandmother was born. Um, at the time, ethnic Romanians made up only a quarter of Chernovitz's 112,000 people. Jews con constituted the biggest group. At least 27% of Chernovitz were Jewish residents, according to the 1930 census. And the city was considered a relatively safe haven for them. Other large groups in the city included Germans, Ukrainians, and Poles. When Nazi Germany invaded Poland in 1939 to start World War II, the Soviet Union used the invasion as a pretense to occupy northern Bukovina, including Chernovitz. Then in 1940, Romania joined forces with Hitler. When the Germans attacked the Soviet Union in June 1941, the Nazis and their Romanian allies quickly overran northern Bukovina and Chernovitz. The Germans arrived in the city in early July of that year and transferred control of the area back to Romania. The Romanians generally bent over backwards to carry out anti-Jewish policies of their German allies. They stripped Jewish citizens of their rights and their property. The city's uh, 50,000 Jewish residents uh, were forced to move into a sealed ghetto. Many residents died from inhumane conditions inside the ghetto and waves of Jewish prisoners were transferred from the ghetto to extermination camps, most to Transnistria. Uh, thousands died en route and those who survived the journey were left to die of starvation, weather and disease. It wasn't until after I published my first novel uh, that Nena filled in some of the gaps in the war stories I'd heard from her. Hearing what she finally shared, I understood why. When I was young, she'd edit out the worst of things to spare me from them. Though when I was young, she'd shared stories about her family life, going to the countryside for a summer where she was chased by geese, her mean as a, sm as a snake, uh, but incredible older sister, Ostrid, their attendance at a ballet academy and the relationships made there. Near the end of her life, she trusted me with much more of it. The complex relationships between her mother and her father, between her sister and her sister's lover, between my grandmother and a man who both provided for and abused her, and what happened to her beloved grandfather. But I'll bet knowing her, even then, she edited out the most painful remembrances as an act of love. And she hoped that I could someday use her experiences in a book. Just name the character Frederica, she said. I always liked that name. This is a photo of my great grandmother, Anna, my great aunt, Ostrid, who becomes Ostra in the book, and my grandmother, Frida. This is my great great grandfather, Heinrich Fishman, Anna's father. These four people are the models for the main characters in The Blood Years. Uh, on the left here, we have um, my grandmother Frida as a young girl and her older sister Ostra. Um, here we have my grandmother um, as a teenager with her sister beside her. This is sort of the range of ages of the characters that um, the story covers. 
The Blood Years is the story of my Nena's teenage years in Chernovitz, Romania, before and during World War II. It's a love story about sisters. It's about ballet and bears and the ways our families can fail us. It's a book about the great and terrible things people do in the name of love. And it's my attempt to do with my Nena stories what I do with all my work, um, to transform pain into art, to embrace ambiguity, and to find beauty even in the ugliest of moments. Um, before I end, I just wanna say one more thing. Um, and let me stop my sharing first. I want the librarians present to know um, how grateful I am um, to them and the work you do to connect young readers with books that matter to them. Your job um, shouldn't be dangerous or scary, um, but I know that right now it might be. And I want you to know that I um, am your partner. I wanna help you advocate for your readers' rights. So please reach out to me at any time if I can help you. My contact information is on my website and the emails come directly to me. Thank you all so much. Oh, Lana, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You definitely have transformed pain into art in the blood years. And um, thank you for giving us the backstory. It was amazing having read it and then seeing those photos, uh, really, really something. Thank you. <clears throat> so I got to gather myself a little bit before I uh, race through a couple of other um, YA fall titles that we have coming. Um, and I will try to remember to say flip slides, Grace. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so this fall, we have a really strong teen list. And as my team was reading through manuscripts and discussing our plans, it occurred to us that a lot of them were would be really good for book club, for really good for book club discussion with teens and, and adults too. So we are launching a campaign in early fall, cleverly called Best Books for Teen Book Clubs. Um, and we're going to launch it, as I said, in the fall with four works by popular award-winning authors. Um, uh, we're going to have a website, which should be ready to go in late August, that'll include a general teen book club guide that we, we tapped a, a librarian to write this for us, um, that has tips for running a club, including how to promote it, how to keep discussion, how to get teens to show up even, because that, of course, is the first uh, order of business, uh, plus conversation starter questions for four featured books, including Alana's The Blood Years, and then the others you'll see here that I'll also talk about. Uh, Charming Young Man, Elliot Schriefer, The Blackwoods by Brandy Colbert, and Those Pink Mountain Nights by Jen Ferguson. So um, Harper Stacks is where all this, uh, we'll have all of this information on, um, you know, when we actually launch it. So if you go there, um, you can find out more information if you are interested in um, us helping you with your own teen book club, either one that you have or one that you want to start. Okay, next slide, please. First up, Charming Young Man. Um, as a New York Times bestselling author with two National Book Award finalists and a Stonewall Ar Honor, Honor Award a win to his credit, Elliot Schrieffer writes across a wide range of genres and this fall he moves into a new genre, historical fiction, and delivers yet another sharp and witty voice with distinct perspective. This is why a historical coming of age, it's set in 1890s Paris. It's about a rising star French pianist navigating his way into high society. I think the best comps are uh, Last Night at the Telegraph Club and um, our very own The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue. Elliot will be at ALA conference uh, this June to pick up his Prince Honor Award for Queer Ducks, which we published last year, and which I think he spoke to us about at our preview last year. Um, so please come and meet him at his events and signings if you're gonna be in Chicago. We'll have details of all of Elliot signing and everybody else on our Harper Stacks social channels. Uh, next slide, please. Brandy Colbert's career highlights include her Stonewall Book Honor uh, award winner, little uh, award winner, Little and Lion, and her Yalsa Excellence in Nonfiction and Horn Book Award winner, Blackbirds in the Sky. In the Blackwoods, Brandy combines her talent for con both contemporary and historical fiction, detailing the lives of a famous Black Hollywood family, from a young actress's rise to fame in the 1940s and 50s to her great-grandchildren's lives in present-day Los Angeles. The result is a story with the glitz and glamour of Tokyo Ever After and permanent record, but focused on a Black family dealing with the challenges of fame and societal expectations. We will publish in October with that killer pick-me-up cover. Uh, next slide, please. 
Another person who will be at ALA to pick up awards is Jen Ferguson, author of The Summer of Bitter and Sweet, which received six starred reviews and was a Morris Award finalist and Stonewall Honor book. In this remarkable second novel, Jen writes about three teens who work together at the local small town pizza place. Berlin and Cameron, who are Matisse and Cree respectively, and Jesse, who is white, together confront the traumas, barriers, and losses that each are facing. As in her previous novel, Jen addresses the endemic violence perpetuated against Native women, as well as issues of mental health and sexuality, all with a deft and considerate touch. Uh, this is also part of our Hartram campaign, um, and we will publish in September. Uh, next slide, please. And this is Resbol, another stellar book on our heart drum list. This is Brian Graves' compelling debut novel. Uh, Ojibwe basketball player Trey Brun is still grieving the death of his older brother when he's given a shot to take his place on his Red Lake Reservations varsity basketball team. But with so much to face down, including racist cops, community expectations, social landmines, and Trey's ongoing sense of loss, will he and the team make it to their first state championship? This is high action sports book with an underdog hook, I think great for reluctant readers and many more. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we have a couple of uh, debuts um, um, coming in the fall. So the first one is Impossible Thing to Say. This is from our new Alida imprint. It's a novel in verse about an Iranian American teen who meets his grandparents for the first time, crushes on a classmate, tries reinventing himself through Shakespeare, falls in love with rap music in the aftermath of 9-11. This is great to hand to fans of The Poet X and Tahara Mafi's A Very Large Expanse of Sea. And just a note about the author who I happened, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting earlier this week. Um, he's kind of awesome and incredible. He's a poet and a playwright and a rapper. He's a co-founder of Pigpen Theater Company, um, an award-winning theater company and band. Um, and under Pigpen, um, Aria has written, directed, and performed original plays as well as books adapted for stage. So he's definitely one, a talent to watch. Um, and this is definitely one to put on your TBR pile. Um, next is Queen. And Queen follows a queer Cambodian American teen's journey to find her voice and step into her legacy. And it's one of the first, if not the first, YA contemporary realistic novels written by and about a Cambodian American. It is set in Lowell, Massachusetts, home to the second largest Cambodian population in the US. And the story brings the community's history, culture, traditions, and beliefs to the forefront. Um, and then the last debut uh, YA book I wanna tell you about is Pretty. Um, and the editor comps this as Concrete Rose Meets Things We Couldn't Say. It's a debut that follows two boys who get caught in the crossfire of a sinister plot that not only threatens everything they love, but may cost them their own chance at love. Pretty honors the queer Black and also the Southern Black experience, two things that are missing on many bookshelves. And um, that's another killer cover. Uh, hat tip to our um, amazing art department for, for that cover. Uh, next slide, please. So this is um, a graphic, non graphic novel, nonfiction um, from the award-winning Don Brown, um, and it's called Run and Hide. In the tightening grip of Hitler's power, towns, cities, and ghettos were emptied of Jews. Unless they could escape, Jewish children would not be spared their deadly fate in the Holocaust. Only 11% of the Jewish children living in Europe before 1939 survived the Second World War. That's a just staggering number. Run and Hyde tells these stories of these children, forced to leave their homes and families as they escape certain horror. Some kids went to England by train, others were hidden, from the Nazis, sometimes in plain sight. Some were secret, secreted away in attics and farmhouses, and still others made miraculous escapes. Acclaimed nonfiction storyteller Don Brown here brings his effort, expertise for journalistic reporting to the deeply felt personal narratives of Jewish kids who survived against overwhelming odds. Thanks for that. Next slide and last slide for me. Um, so three uh, terrific uh, fantasy novels by really popular authors that your kids in your life are going to be excited about. The first is Scarlet Veil. Vale. Um, so uh, Shelby's blockbuster hit series Serpent and Dove has concluded, but never fear. Readers can now embark on a dark and thrilling vampire romance set in the same world, and it was also guaranteed to leave them breathless. And then Champion of Fate. This is number one New York Times bestselling author Kendara Blake's 
uh, new novel. She's back with an epic duology starter that follows a young woman training to join a fabled order as she attempts to lead a hero to his critical first victory. And then last but not least, Doc, Dark Air. This is the hotly anticipated sequel to C.S. Pascat's New York Times bestseller, Dark Rise. Now that Will has discovered his true identity, how far will he go to evade his predestined role? Um, School Library Journal loved this and called it a great recommendation for anyone who enjoyed uh, Cassandra Clare's historical Shadow Hunter. So that's a nice, a nice comp there. Um, I think that's it for um, uh, Teen. The books that we're going to present again, again. Um, look at our catalog. There are a lot of other books um, that I think you and your patrons will be interested in. Um, there's the link uh, to the Edelweiss collection. I again, mentioned that Edelweiss and NetGalley has all e-galleys that are available. Um, and Edelweiss has PDFs of all the picture books. Mimi Rankin, who uh, presented earlier, will be happy to answer any questions that you have for materials or about these books or about our authors. Um, and yeah, if you don't already follow the Harper Stacks on Twitter, Facebook, um, our blog, our newsletter, like, please do. We've got some really great stuff there. I think that's it. It's one o'clock. Um, I think I'm going to kick it back to book list. Yes. That's to me. Yes. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank and you. <laughs> Thank you also to Joanna, Max, Sean, Alana, and to the rest of the Harper Stacks team. That was a wonderful preview and amazing author presentations. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's video recording, title list, slide presentation, and a certificate of completion. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. Recently, ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom reported 1,269 demands to censor library books and resources in 2022, the highest number of attempted book bans since ALA began compiling data about censorship in libraries more than 20 years ago. Join the Unite Against Book Bans campaign to help protect the freedom to read and to empower readers everywhere. Visit uniteagainstbookbans.org for more information, resources to donate, and more. And remember that you can utilize Booklist to support your library's collection development choices with reviews backed by the ALA. We have a special webinar subscription offer, and don't forget that your subscription dollars help ALA advocate on behalf of libraries, assisting those facing an unprecedented number of book challenges. Email us at info at booklistonline.com for more information. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, and one more huge thank you to our special author guests and to our sponsor, HarperCollins Children's Books. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time.